If you'll turn in your Bibles to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. This Thursday coming up, we will celebrate a national holiday that's been set aside for Thanksgiving. And so this morning I thought I would do a sermon called The Thankful Heart. And it is impressive to remember that when Thanksgiving was initiated as a national holiday, its purpose was to give thanks to God. And so for those who want to separate God from our original government or our original forefathers, uh, when George Washington saw the need for our nation to give thanks to God, uh, that's how this uh, came about. It led towards what we call Thanksgiving. And we can give thanks for any number of things in our lives, but uh, our number one purpose of thankfulness should be God. And um, when it was set up as a national holiday, its first and primary intent was to give thanks to God. In Psalm 100, we find a, a psalm of praise to God, a call to praise, in which we see what uh, it takes to have a thankful heart and the result of a thankful heart. The psalmist writes, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. The Bible tells us that we are to be a thankful people, a people who give thanks. And our primary thanks ought to be to God for His mercy, for His love, for His care, for His providence, for all the things that He has shown unto us, but as Christians and for those who are looking for salvation, the greatest thanks that is due to God is the thanks for an opportunity to have the hope of eternal life, to the thankfulness that is due our God for making it possible that we have our sins forgiven, to have our sins washed away. Though we don't merit it or we don't deserve it, God has made a way because of His love towards us and His mercy and His grace that we can have our sins taken away, our sins forgiven, so that on the day of judgment we don't have to give an account for those sins. They will have been paid for by the Christ. And that's why Paul in Colossians chapter 1 says, beginning in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We ought to always give thanks to God the Father, who has made it possible for us to have the inheritance of those who have been called out of the world, who have been translated into the kingdom, translated into the kingdom, and having redemption and having forgiveness, all one act having heard the gospel and believed it and repented of our past sins, uh, acknowledging the deity of the Christ, the Savior of the world, being immersed in water. Upon that obedience, the Lord adds those individuals to His church. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. It's where an individual has his sins washed away at baptism. Revelation 1, verse 5, and Acts 22, verse 16. It's at that point where he's forgiven of his sins, where his sins have been remitted. Acts chapter 2, and verse 38. And it's where he's been placed into the kingdom of God. Acts 2 verse 47. And so we have a lot to be thankful for if we are a Christian. And if we're not a Christian, it's a great deal to be thankful for that we have the hope. 
if we will simply submit ourselves to God. That the opportunity is still available, and I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. The, the fact that opportunities still exist. But a thankful heart is one that we ought to have as Christians, and a thankful heart ought to be for those who are still looking to know that truth exists and that if I want to be saved, the opportunity is there for me to be saved. Here in the psalm that we just read, we see many things about what it is to have a thankful heart and what will come from a thankful heart. We see that a thankful heart is a humble heart. Notice in Psalm 100, verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, He is God. There is a, a place for all of us, isn't it? And that place for us is one of humility. To know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. And not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Without God, we are nothing. Without God, we have nothing. Without God, there is no light but darkness. Without God, there is no hope but defeat. And so we should humble ourselves. A thankful heart is thankful to God for what He has blessed us with and for the, the opportunities that He has given us. And the thankful heart is a humble heart, recognizing our place in the world, our place in the whole scheme of things, right? Know that God is in charge, that God is in control, that God is supreme, and that we are merely His people, His sheep, right? That we understand our place, one of humility. Jesus exhibited that humility when He came to this earth and giving Himself uh, for the sins of mankind, though He Himself guilty of no sin, but gave for us an example of humility. In Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13 beginning in verse 10, The Hebrews writer, and you'll remember that the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrew Christians, Christians who had converted out of Judaism. And so the Hebrews book was written for the purpose of encouraging those Christians to uh, appreciate what they now had in New Testament Christianity and not to be tempted to go back into Judaism which was what was taking place in the first century. And the Hebrews writer takes the time in this inspired book to show that the system of Christianity is much better than the old law and that the new law uh, is in effect and the old law was done away with. And in verse 10, the inspired writer says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So first of all, let's see the analogy or the allusion here of those animal sacrifices under the old law, the blood that needed to be shed on behalf of the people in order to take care of the sins of the people in the Old Testament, where the priests would take those animals and sacrifice them, and then they would discard the bodies outside the gate. They would take that outside the gate. And the picture being seen is that the blood of that animal would uh, atone or would uh, appease God for the sins that had taken place. And then that animal would be taken outside the gate representative of getting the sin out of the city, you see. That took place under the Old Testament. It had to take place often because uh, of the sins of the people. But because of Jesus, there is now one sacrifice for all time and He sacrificed Himself, His own blood, and He, because of His sacrifice, there's no more need for those animal sacrifices. But notice the picture given. Jesus also that He might sanctify or clean the people with His own blood suffered without the gate. They took Him outside the city too. Why? Because He bore the sins of the people. He wasn't guilty of our sins. 
But he paid the price for our sins. And he took upon himself that task voluntarily to sacrifice his own blood to cleanse the people, but also to be considered unclean to be taken outside of the city, to take the sins with him. Now, notice verse 13. The inspired writer says, Let us go forth therefore unto him, where? Without the camp. Bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Our sacrifice to him is our worship. Seen in our singing, our prayers, our teaching, our partaking of the Lord's Supper, our giving upon each first day of the week. Our obedience to His Word is our, our sacrifice to Him. It's a, a spiritual sacrifice, not a physical sacrifice. But notice verse 13. Verse 12 shows us the humility of the Christ, that He was willing to take the shame of one who would die outside the city to die on a cross was the most shameful way to have died. It was considered an embarrassment. It was considered a disgrace. It was considered uh, a dis, a just disdainful. And Jesus voluntarily did that. And He carried His own cross outside the city. And the Bible tells us, let us go to Him. You know, people today, we talked a little bit this morning in our Bible class, Today, people want to congregate with the winners. We want to go where the celebration is. We want to go where the victory is. We want to go where uh, everybody is saying everything's okay, right? Generally, that's where people gather together. They don't gather together with the disgraceful, shameful person that's hanging on a cross, do they? Outside the city. So so disgusting we had to take it outside the city. That's not where the people gather together mostly, is it? They gather together with what they consider to be the, the great and the grand and the wonderful. And the inspired Hebrews writer says, let's take on that shame ourselves. Let's go, without the, let's go outside the gate and let's go bear some shame with Jesus. You know, we, we, we will never have to bear the cross or a cross like Jesus bore, but we are called upon to bear our own burdens. That is, that there are burdens that come from being faithful to God and faithful to the Christ. And some of, sometimes that may be being cast away or cast off from the crowd, right? Because the world hates truth. And... They don't want any part of that truth. And so they'll cast that truth outside the gate, right? And the Hebrews writer says, let us do that. Humble ourselves. Rather than wanting to be built up by the world and to be seen by men as uh, pleasing to men, let us gather ourselves outside the gate where Jesus sacrificed and offered Himself for the people. Let us go forth therefore unto Him without the camp. Let's go to the one at the cross. There weren't many people at the cross, were there? The disciples had fled. There were very few at the cross. Mary, John. There were very few. Why? Because it was a disgrace. It was a shame. And the others feared, perhaps, for their own lives or were ashamed themselves. But here we have an opportunity to go forth to Him as He is being shamed, as He's being disgraced, and say, We stand by Him. That's the humility of a thankful heart. In Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, the uh, inspired Paul says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, 
Why was Paul thankful? Why would Paul not cease to give thanks for these individuals? Because he had heard of their faith and the love that they had had one to another. They humbled themselves, didn't they? And Paul, one of a man of humility, humbled himself. And this humility brought together a thankful people because a thankful heart is a humble heart. A humble heart then is a subservient heart. You won't find a lot of proud, arrogant men serving others, will you? <laughs> a thankful heart is a humble heart, and a humble heart is a subservient heart. One that seeks to do for others. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, Paul again says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves. Why was he thankful? What, what, was, the need, what was the reason for this thankful heart? Because these individuals through their humility served one another, didn't they? They submitted one to another. They sought to help one another. They saw others above self. Their thankfulness led to humility and their humility led to service. In 1 Peter chapter 5, the Apostle Peter says in verses 5 and verse 6, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. A show of respect, a show of humility, uh, right? A show of thankfulness perhaps. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists, resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. You know, just a moment ago we talked about those in the crowd, those in the in crowd, those who gather in the multitudes are the ones looking to be exalted, right? They don't go where... Uh, things might be shameful or disgraceful or disdainful. And we're not talking sinful here. We're talking about being with the Christ. And uh, being with the Christ at that time was seen as a shame because he was cast outside the city. He hanged on a cross, which was considered uh, uh, the worst of all deaths for the worst of all criminals. To have stood by him would have been to be uh, defending him and to be in, uh, partaking of that shame. And the Hebrews writer says, do it, right? And then here, the Apostle Peter says, humble yourselves before God that He may exalt you in the end, right? Don't look to be exalted by men today. What men see is good. What men see is exaltation worthy. And what God sees as exaltation worthy are two different things, aren't they? What man lifts up on a pedestal and what God lifts up on a pedestal are two different things. God looked down upon His beloved Son hanging on that horrible cross and He saw a faithful servant, didn't He? He saw a faithful Son who loved His Father. The world saw a disgraced man, a shameful man who should be embarrassed, right? And so where did the multitudes go? They didn't go to the Lord, did they? They didn't want to be with that. We need to go there rather than where the men are exalted today. A thankful heart is a humble heart and a humble heart is a subservient heart. Then we find that a subservient heart one that puts self uh, below others and puts the desires and the needs of others in perspective is a loving heart. Those who seek to do good for others, those who seek to serve, those individuals are loving people, aren't they? And just as it is the case that many people say they love, but in their actions do not, Many people say they're thankful, but in their actions they are ungrateful. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to say thank you or I'm thankful, but your actions show whether you are thankful or not. And the same goes with love. You know, you might say 
you love Jesus, but what do your actions show? You may say you love God and His Word, but what do your actions show? You may say you love His church for which He purchased with His own blood, but what do your actions show? See, it's one thing to say you love. It's one thing to say thank, uh, you're thankful, but it's another thing to be thankful. It's another thing to act loving. And a subservient heart from a thankful heart and a humble heart is one that is a loving heart. Humility and thankfulness is a means of showing one's love, isn't it? In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And then in verse 21, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Now this is a very condemning statement, isn't it? It's very uplifting to know that we can know how to express our love to God through obedience to His Word. It's very uplifting to know how that we can have fellowship with Christ. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And we, verse 23, will come to Him and make our abode with Him. The fellowship that we have with God and the Christ comes through our exhibition of our faith. Obedience to the law. Obedience to the commands of God. And so it's one thing to say thank you or one thing to say I love you, but it's another to actually exhibit thankfulness and love. And we do that with our actions. By doing, by not just saying. But how condemning is it in verse 24 to those who say they love God but do not what He says. Those who say they love the Word but do not what it says. Those who say they love the church but do nothing to defend her. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. We need to make sure that we're not just saying, right? That we're doing. Because it's one thing to say and another to do. A subservient heart is a loving heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, <clears throat> beginning verse 7, we read, Therefore as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, or in speech, and in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. What's he talking about? Verse 7 he said, I want you to make this grace abound. What grace is he talking? Verse 8, he says, Prove the sincerity of your love. What is this grace? What is this means of proving your sincerity of your love? Verse 10, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, or this is verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He humbled himself. He gave himself as a servant. He loved and he acted upon it, didn't he? And that leads to the next point. What was this grace that we were to show and to abound 
How is it that we are to show the sincerity of our love? It's through our giving, isn't it? Because a loving heart is a giving heart. A loving heart is a giving heart. Jesus, because of His love for mankind, though He was rich, made Himself poor, didn't He? Now we're not talking financially. We're talking Jesus was in heaven. The Creator of the world. The world created by Him and for Him and by Him all things consist. And He voluntarily and because of the will of the Father came to this earth and put on flesh like one of the created. And why did He do that? He didn't do it for Him, did He? He didn't do it for Him. He didn't do it for any pleasure of His own, did He? This was a very harmful thing to Himself, as it turns out. But He did it because He loved us, didn't He? That's why He did it. He gave Himself, didn't He? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, verse 16. A loving heart is a giving heart. God so loved the world that He gave. And Jesus so loved the world that He gave. And as a loving people, we ought to be givers. That's, as I mentioned, it's not always financial in our giving. We're to give our time and our efforts and our abilities to God, to His church, to prioritize things, right? To make sure that we're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Matthew 6, verse 33. the ultimate example of love given to us by God, given to us by His Son, the ultimate example of thankfulness given to us by His Son, the humble heart, the subservient heart, the loving heart, and the giving heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, Paul writes, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. Now He that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, notice, which causeth through us, what? Thanksgiving to God. <laughs> Notice again, which causes through us thanksgiving to someone else. God. You'll note in chapter 8, the subservient heart is a loving heart. The loving heart noticed the grace of God had bestowed upon them great things, hadn't it? And that they could abound in that grace also. What was that grace? To share what God had given them. Right? To prove the sincerity of their love. How did God prove the sincerity of His love? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But why do we give? Is it for us? Is it to be seen of men? No, no, no. Right? 
being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God. Now that's where we started, isn't it? And now that's where we end. <laughs> it's all about making sure that we give thanks to God. You and I have a role in that. We have the ability to bring about thanksgiving to God through how we live and how we act. People can see in us good. People can see in us a humble heart, a subservient heart, a loving heart, a giving heart. And because of what they see in us, cause thanksgiving to God. Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works but glorify your Father who is in heaven, right? <laughs> We're here to serve God. We're here to give thanks to God. And our thankful heart must be a humble heart, a subservient heart, a loving heart, and a giving heart. And if we have those aspects in our life, then the world will see our good works. And through those good works, give glory to God in heaven. And that's why we're here. To bring about glorification of God in this church. When your friends and colleagues see your works, do they see someone who puts God first? Do they see someone who puts the church, Jesus purchased with His blood, first? Do they see a thankful heart? Do they see a humble heart? Do they see a subservient heart? Do they see a, a loving heart? Do they see a giving heart? Or do they see one who puts emphasis on self, puts emphasis on I, puts emphasis on me, just like the rest of the world? Through our actions, we can bring about thanksgiving to God, but also through our actions, we can cause the world to remain at ease to do nothing. Let us with a thankful heart be thankful to God for the opportunities He has given us not just to be saved from our past sins, but to share that salvation with others. Right? And that's why we're here, to be right with God and to share that glorious good news to others. Let us make sure that our actions do not harm our words. Let us be a thankful people with a humble heart a subservient heart, a loving heart, and a giving heart. And the greatest thing we can give is what God has given to us, His Word. Because it's in His Word that tells us how to be saved, how to remain saved. The Bible tells us faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. The Bible tells us that faith without works of obedience is dead, James 2, verse 17. So we need to add to our faith as the Apostle Peter says in the Christian graces. We need to repent of our past sins. It's sin that separated us from God in the first place. We need to acknowledge our wrongdoing and repent of those things. Then we must need to have those sins washed away, and that takes place in water baptism, Acts 2, verse 38. Based upon our obedience to the gospel, which we have heard, the Bible tells us that God will wash away our sins. He will add us to His church. And if we'll remain faithful to Him to the end, when His Son returns, we'll go to heaven to be with Him in eternity.